to four. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening to us through your radio on one of the 16 stations that is broadcasting our program, through a simple radio app, the TuneIn app, through our website, that website is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com under the season four tab at the top of the page. Podcast replay or in studio video replay. We thank you for being part of the program. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co host, best friend and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is about you to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, your trees to grow better and the grass to grow greener as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. There's a couple of ways in which you can get a hold of us. You can do that in which to email us, gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can also give us a call anytime, 24-7, if you can't get to uh, a safe location to give us a call right now. Remember the number, 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. Uh, call us, leave a message if we can't get you on the program right now, and we will give you a call back. We've got a big program lined up for you today, as we do each and every week when we come to you and you allow us to be part of your world for a little bit of your weekend. We're going to talk about in segment one, winter composting, as well in segment two, five things to prep for spring, but do it now. And our guest will be author Pamela Crawford, and we'll answer your garden question. So, Holly, let's get into the program and tackle the job of winter composting, the do's, the don'ts, and how to go about doing it so you are successful. For sure. I think the biggest thing when it comes to winter composting is thinking about what what like what method of composting you're going to do. And I'm not talking about um like a hot compost. I'm talking about if you have your compost bin outside whether it be like a compost pile versus a tumbler, um, it's good to think about that because depending on where you live, you could face some challenges. Right. Up here where we're located and many parts of the country that uh, hear our show each week on the radio are at very, very frigid temperatures uh, here in southeast Wisconsin. It is not uncommon uh, some of the colder times of winter to have five degrees Fahrenheit ambient temperature with a wind chill of negative 20 to negative 30 degrees. That is not a regular occurrence, but it does happen quite frequently. So if you're thinking about, oh, I'm just going to have a compost pile, a little compost pile in the backyard and make compost during the winter, you will want to think again. Yes, you can just go ahead and dump your kitchen scraps on top of that existing pile. Assume your, assuming your municipality allows for such of an open pile to exist, but the activity in which that pile will be almost non-existent because of that cold temperatures that are being created by the weather. Right. So that's something that you want to think about is the the pile. Um, now, if you can use a compost tumbler or a turner, that would be more ideal because you're going to have it off the ground and you can keep it from hopefully freezing. Well, if you're going to tumble in a tumbler, that's quite easy to do. If you've got it on the ground and you have a substantial pile, there is some internal warmth that is created during the breakdown process if the right balances are achieved in the pile, the browns and the greens. And in order to get that to turn over, you can take a 
fork, a garden fork or a shovel, and move that ground pile from point A to point B. Or you can go to uh, powerplanter.com and get their 36 or 48-inch auger and attach it to your drill and mix it that way as well and make it very convenient as a composting uh, mixer. Now, one thing people don't always think about is making sure you're adding the carbon or the brown during the winter. So what happens is that during the winter, you might be collecting all of your kitchen scraps and putting them out to the compost or into the compost, but you're not thinking about like things like dried leaves or straw or yard debris. You can also use shredded paper and cardboard. Now, some people shy away from the cardboard uh, application because of the levels of toxicity that may exist in the glue that the cardboard is put together. However, if you're eating fast food, if you're living in an urban setting, you're already ingesting some level of toxicity. A little bit in a cardboard box is probably not going to be detrimental to you or the soil in your garden. Right. And with that being said, um, one thing you can do if you are concerned about the browns you're adding or the carbon you're adding is you can collect your leaves in the fall put them in a bag and then as you um as you compost throughout the winter you can add some leaves as you add your greens. And, and what we do is we just make a giant mountain of leaves in the garden over top of our garden beds and that way it's accessible and ready to use in the spring but in the application of a compost uh winter composting you can certainly include those uh and you can get a, a paper shredder and shred the paper and mix that in as well. Um also, there's other things that you can add. Uh, the, the key to this whole winter composting thing is, number one, it's not going to be as rapid as it would be in July when it's in December or January. Number two, if the pile is frozen, it's not breaking down or breaking down incredibly slow. So we want to keep that pile above freezing. And there's some ways in which we can do this. Right. So one thing you can do is definitely um, is to insulate it. So if you if you have an active compost right now and you can dump it in your garden for the winter or over a garden bed, you want to do that. And then you would take some straw or some cardboard and try to kind of line the compost, especially if you have a compost pile. Um, if you have a turner, you're just going to have to make sure you have um, you keep turning it to help to help keep whatever's in there moving and composting. So if we have it on the ground, what you mean by insulation is like take three pallets or four pallets and create a a box and then uh, put straw, the leaves of the straw. When you break a square bell open, there's what's called leaves, which are about six or eight, six inches uh, compaction is the way the the baler makes it. So you would stack those kind of like an R factor in an attic. The, The more thicker you put it, the more... Uh, warmth in which you can contain in that pile. Right, and you would cover it with a tarp or something as yeah. well. Yeah. So that that's one way of insulation. And then as you turn the pile, the activative uh, ingredients, the, ground, the browns and the greens, will interact with the oxygen and create a warmth in the internal portions of the compost pile. Uh, in the summertime, it would be, it's not uncommon to get a hot compost pile to get to 170, 180 degrees. Some of these large manufacturers of compost in the humongous mountain windrows, as they are defined as, um, they have very successfully roasted turkey wrapped in tinfoil in these mounds of compost because it's over 200 and 250 degrees in the center of these things. So the compost can get very hot in the, uh, a summertime, it will not exceed that magnitude if you don't have the volume to go with it. Right. So then another thing you want to do is you want to think about the moisture level in your compost pile. But wouldn't that freeze, though? But we're keeping it warm and heated, mm-hmm. essentially, to avoid that frozen block of compost. Right. Depends on where you are. But um, insulation should help keep the moisture in. Also, you have to think about if you are using like a compost tumbler, you, if you have enough greens, it should keep the moisture in as well. Um, if you live in like the Pacific Northwest where it just rains a lot throughout the winter, um, you might want to invest in a tumbler or a turner versus a pile because it could get almost too moist. Well, when we talk about, we always, we all, we're all familiar with a tumbler, whether it's homemade out of a, 
55 gallon drum or commercial grade tumbler of many shapes and sizes and capacities. When we have it on the ground, the size is the key here. Now, the pile should be about four foot in diameter and about three foot deep. So you've got a very good size amount of material in which is breaking down over this uh, time period. And again, you can cover it with a plastic tarp or there's cloth tarps that you can, that are a little more thicker that may hold in that, uh, the, the heat a little bit better. Um, so you can do that as well. Put rocks along the edge so that the tarp doesn't flow, fly over. And the other thing with winter composting in the, any aspect of it, when it snows, the snow is actually an insulation. Uh, it, it creates the, there's a certain chart that based on the number of inches, it equates to the number of R factors as the insulation would be in your attic or in your walls. When, a, when it's, when it snows on the farm, let, let's say this time of year, it snows. We've got a lot of rain and it snows, but it, it doesn't freeze the ground. So you're still breaking through the, the soil and you can't get out and harvest the crops. You want that hard freeze before the snow. That way the, the equipment can travel over without breaking through. That's ins- that snow insulates that ground and keeps it from freezing. So when you get insulate, when you get the snow on the, on the tarp or on top of your pile, that's actually a good thing. It's holding the heat in, even though it doesn't seem it's counterintuitive. It does hold and keeps it from freezing. Right. So that is <clears throat> snow, snow is actually can be very insulating, as you'd said. Now, if you are not, if you just determine that outdoor composting is not for you, you're just going to let, maybe you just have a compost pile and you're like, I don't want to try to insulate it. I don't want to try to do this, blah, blah, blah. None of this mumble jumbo stuff. Yeah. Mumble jumbo stuff. You're like, my compost pile is out. None of no, your business. 300 feet out back right. or something and you don't want to deal with it. So you can do indoor composting and a popular way is doing worm composting. You're probably thinking, I don't know if I want to invite a bunch of worms into my home, but this is typically done on your own level. Um, like on a homeowner's level or a renter's level or whatever with, um, like a big, a big Rubbermaid type container. And then you would add the worms and add your compost scraps and then they would break it down. So it is contained. Yeah. There is some steps and, and correct procedures, uh, in order to move through that, but it works very, very well. And the worms, you have to get special worms here and the worms will not overpopulate themselves. Once they get to a certain level, of population, they will stop reproducing unless you take a certain group of them or a, a number of them and move to another composting bin. Then they will start reproducing again. They're very unique uh, creatures, and then they will also create worm castings, which are very beneficial to your garden that you can take and sprinkle out in the garden or put in a tub or whatever and save until springtime. Or you can save for seed starting. You can directly sow plants in worm castings as well. So that worm, and it doesn't stink. That's the thing that a lot of people think, oh, it's, it's, it's going to smell like a cattle lot in here because I got worms eating. But if you do it right, it, and there's many great videos and articles online, if you do it correctly, it is very, very beneficial and it works very, very well with that. Right. So that is another way to, to compost indoors. There's also, they also sell all sorts of different, uh, food cyclers, basically is what they are. And what they do is they dehydrate your kitchen scraps and then chop them up to then break them down faster once they're dehydrated. The likeliness of them spoiling slows down. So then once they're dehydrated like that, you would add them to your compost in the summer or in the spring. In the spring, all right. So this is just the, the little, Ice, uh, tip of the iceberg when it comes to winter composting. You want to put that on your radar so you're aware that it does exist and uh, you can do more research if you want to extend and make compost over the winter at a lower, slower process or if you just want to take it and, and dump the stuff in, the, in a pile in the garden and then deal with it in spring. That certainly is uh, a very good reason, a very good way to go about doing it uh, too. Well, did you thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our 33rd show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about mums, uh, fall mums. We talked about maintaining your evergreen trees. And our guest was author Wendy Williams. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. Or we'll make it even easier. You send us an email to Garden Talk Radio 
at gmail.com and in the subject line you would put show 32 and we will send you the link. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about five things to do now ahead of time for spring. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Do your trees look sad? When we here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens have a tree or shrub issue, Dr. Jim's is the product we reach for as it is the product that works. It really provides results. Their small batch, extra potent blend of readily available nutrients is exactly what your trees, plants, and bushes need to regain their health and stay bug free. It's super easy to use. It feeds the microbes and adds new life to your soil. So you can grow stronger plants, chemical-free, environmentally responsible fertilizer that works. It will put a smile on your face and your plants. To find out more about Tree Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Trim bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with the static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raised beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. So as gardeners... As homesteaders, as preppers, whatever you want to call and label yourself as, or just a human, uh, we want to prepare ourselves and make moves ahead of time so we're not so pressed for time or feel overindulged or over anxious about, hey, all these things have to be done yesterday and it's two days from now. So what we talk about here, we're going to go over about five, six, seven things here in which we can do now in fall. That will accelerate and prepare and be done for the most part when spring comes and you feel like you've got three days to get the whole garden planted and, uh, which is not necessarily true, but we all put ourselves in that box where we think that, 
well, it's, it's, you know, long range forecast. Everything's going to go good. Uh, got to get everything in the ground now, which we'll talk about that next year in season five on how to pace yourself and do things right the first time. Um, and not be overwhelmed. So, Holly, let's uh, make uh, let's go through the list here and see what we can uh, prepare for now, so we don't have to do as much in the spring in certain areas. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, you were putting yourself in a box. I was putting myself in a box. Um, <clears throat> so, which is is not a good idea. Um, so, you want to go through your seeds now. I think that's a good idea, especially if you've started saving seeds and um, maybe you can have knowledge, organize them. What have you? When you use the word saved seeds, test the, the germination viability of them because early this, uh, early this year, when everything was hitting the fan, if you want to call it that, uh, we planted lettuce in the windowsill from seeds, from lettuce seeds that were, <clears throat> uh, seven, eight, nine years old, zero germination. So we want to be aware that, okay, we're going to save seeds. And obviously these weren't saved in the most economic the most efficient best way ever but if you're saving seeds to grow and they're six eight nine ten years old check them to see if there's any possible germination rate and and how we do such is put them in a soil or put them in a damp paper towel in a ziploc bag ten of them and then keep it moist and see what germinates and that's how you figure out your percentile of uh, germination rate, you lose about 10% each year is a good rule of thumb. But if none of these seeds are, are germinating or you have a 10% germination rate, why are you saving that bag or that, that uh, jar of seeds when they're no good? Well, I was kind of referring to like the seeds you save from the plants now. Well, yeah, yeah. I, all, hope, all, I hope those germinate. Right. Yeah. yeah. They should if, if you've allowed them to mature properly on, on the vine. Um, in the garden. But yeah, go through your seeds. Uh, go to seedsavers.org and, and see what they have available right now. And, and they may be on sale or that you, you may just be able to get a hold of some that you're needing in order to complete your seed collection. Uh, you can check and go to seedsavers.org and see if they may have the seeds in which you are looking for. If they're, and they may be on sale in order to complete the seed, uh, uh, your seed library that you need to, to your grow seed your, dreams. Yeah, your seed dreams that you need to mm-hmm. complete your garden plans for next year. Uh, next thing is your tools. Yeah, you can go through your tools. Um, maybe you discovered that your shovel, your shovel broke. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so you, you have to think about that. Maybe there's a, maybe you're like, Hey, I, I got this, uh, this gift card for my birthday in July, and now I don't know what to do with it, and maybe I'll go buy myself a shovel. Well, and we don't have any tool companies uh, sponsoring the show. Uh, we've reached out to them. If you're listening and you're a tool company, uh, give us an email. Uh, send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and let's talk turkey uh, for next year. Uh, but we, you know, we have learned from our experience, Holly, and, and many of you will nod your heads in agreement. Just be, If it's El Cheapo on sale, it ain't going to last the season. If you're actually using it for garden purposes, it's going to break. It's going to bend. It's quality is paid with money and you get what you pay for. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you want to think about your tools and, and well, also with your tools, clean them off. And if the shovels, if the shovels need, um, if the shovels need sharpening, uh, you can, you can prevent them from rusting by you. Some people spray like a, uh, a, a petroleum product on it other people will take like a vegetable oil and rub it down to keep them from rusting uh so that's another thing in which you can do yeah you can do some research on how to clean your tools um so another thing you can do is you can think about what did well think about what you might change take some notes take some pictures like one thing you and i joey we've determined we're not going to grow potatoes correct Mm -hmm. it just doesn't work for us now it works in your sister's backyard way better than what it does in the garden. And we, we've done it in every way, shape, or form. And fresh compost and old garden soil, doesn't matter. Uh, grow bags, raised beds in the ground. Uh, we can plant multiple plants of green beans or tomatoes and uh, be better off. Yeah. It's, you know, so that's just, we're not going to do that. And also take pictures. So when it's cold and snowy, you can remember, oh, yeah, I had sweet corn planted there. I can't put that there again. Or can I put that there? Uh, crop rotation, is that important? You know, all that. You, there's a lot of things in which we can do over the winter. But take pictures now 
because it's a lot easier to see before the snow falls, and then you can actually plan out more detail. And and the other thing about <clears throat> uh, in the springtime, we all do this. Well, should I plant that there? Or should I plant it over there? What about it? it it's it just put it in the ground. Uh, Grandpa says the seeds grow a lot better in the ground than in the bag in the garage. <laughs> just get them in the ground. Right. right. It, this is not. You, Many of you are planting a garden for recreation and for some produce, but your decision whether to put a tomato there or a zucchini plant there is not going to be detrimental. It's not, you're not trying to operate an 18,000 acre farm. And if you make this mistake, you're going to have a $10,000 loss on your hands. That type of thing. Just put it in the ground. I agree. So another thing you can do is you want to gather your leaves for, for spring. Um, so if you, Maybe you have a, a beautiful, you a bunch of trees and you get all these leaves and you're like, okay, well, I already put them over my garden. You can put them somewhere dry, whether that be, you know, fill up some trash bags, put them in a shed, but you can gather your leaves now so that you have them for mulch come spring. Yeah. Or just put them in a big giant pile in, in the corner of the yard. That's fine as well. Uh, but leaves, get them now because they won't be around. Um, even if you don't pick them up, somehow a lot of them disappear over the winter uh, for a variety of reasons, especially in the city. If you're not picking up now, the, the city's going to get them and you're not going to see them. So that's why it's important to mound them up. If you're in the country, you can just kind of go to the woods and, and pick them out of the woods if you need them. Um, drain your irrigation system. Otherwise, you're going to be in, buying a new irrigation system from DripWorks.com in the spring. They would appreciate that, but also they would much rather you drain it now uh, to get the water out of it because water expands and will break the hoses, the feeder lines and the drip tape and all the, the emitters. So what we have done, and if you have the capabilities of having a air compressor, you can blow the lines out that way or you can get a shot vac or an upright vacuum that you can revert the air to blow out instead of the vacuum in port. And then you can tape the hose to the feeder line and you can actually blow the water out of the irrigation pipe with the vacuum. Even if you have a little residue left in the pipes, that's very minimal. That's not going to hurt anything. It's whenever the pipes are loaded full of water, that's when the problem occurs and the cracks and the pops and the, the replacement needs to happen in the spring. So we want to be able to be sure to drain the irrigation system out. Toss out uh, the de diseased leaves, the early blight, the bean rust. If kept in your garden, you can reintroduce that. If kept in your compost pile, you can reintroduce that in the spring because you've kept warm enough. If you don't get all of the residue out for the blight or the rust, it's not going to be that detrimental. It's going to die because of the cold temperatures in many portions of the country. But if you put it in your compost pile, keep it warm enough, or put it in the city's compost, it's going to be reintroduced because it's going to stay warm, and that's you just want to throw it in the trash. Don't want to burn it. Uh, you can also construct some low tunnels in the uh, garage or the shed and get those ready if you want to get an early jump start on that in the spring. Certainly, there's many good videos online in order to do such. Or um, even grow boxes. Is that what they're called? Yeah, grow boxes. Grow boxes. Yeah. Maybe you want to construct that or think about gathering supplies for that. Think about what you might have. Um, even like, some, you know, sometimes you get a warm fall where we might get some cold weather at the end of October and it warms up again. That's something you could definitely do on one of those warm Saturday weekend days. But yeah, you can um, construct some low tunnels or think about how, where you might put them come spring, kind of plan for that. Another thing you can do is buy potting soil. Uh, you were at the garden center. Yep, I was at our local Blue Mills here in Milwaukee, the official garden center for the Milwaukee uh, broadcast. Uh, they still have some compost and some uh, potting soil mixes available as well as their bulk material. But if you're at your garden center and uh, you can get some of that on sale, have it ready to go and not have to do the fr fury and rush of buying it in the spring. Uh, because if you keep it in a cool, dry place, it's going to be just as good as it would be in, in four or five months. Now, if you keep it for six or seven years, the might not be as good in the bag. But keep that in mind, as well as you can be prepared or preparing yourself for the seed starting procedure in January, February, March by cleaning your trays and cups and whatever you start them in by using hot soapy water just to get them all clean, fresh, make sure there's no potential residue of diseases or bacteria on your seed starting trays and cups and, and kind of see your inventory there. And if you need to get more uh, seed 
trays, you can go to RootMaker.com and use coupon code TWBG and get 10% off your entire order. They got some great seed starting trays, root propagation trays that we use and uh, we've had them for seven years, and they're just as good as the day we bought them. Uh, they're they're thicker plastic than the old cheapo stuff you get from the the, the garden. Or center. maybe maybe yeah, like you said, maybe you want to just um, go through what you have, repair them. Maybe sometimes you just have to take some take notes, duct tape, and <laughs> put them back together. But I think that's I think that's one thing people don't think about, and it comes like January, and they're like, oh, I want to start these seeds, and then... I'll just know, buy everything new. I'll just, yeah, I'll just buy everything throw new. Throw everything, or... throw the old stuff out and buy new. We don't need to do that. Your, your stuff is perfectly good. You just need to uh, repair it, see what you got, see what you need, and go from there. We're talking about going from there. Uh, the Japanese beetles will be back in spring. The nights are getting colder. The days are getting shorter. Kids are virtually learning. The lawn has been forgotten. But you don't need to forget your lawn. There's still you can do a little love to your lawn to make sure that you have a better lawn next year. Yeah, just because it's fall, we don't want to forget um, about our yards and those Japanese beetles. They may be gone, but they're not far. Um, so you can go ahead and think about how they're going to feast on your roses and berries this summer. They laid eggs in your turf, and so that they can start again next year. You want to take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granular. That specifically targets scarab pests and their larvae. Simply attach the granular with a spreader, irrigate it into the soil. And let Simply them apply it. Don't attach ab- it. You, <laughs> you apply it to the, apply with a spreader. It. Yeah, the spreader. You're just going to go all out on the Japanese beetles. Yeah. And, um, yeah, irrigate it into the soil and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is grub gone easy to apply, as we just talked about using it with the spreader, but it is also the only non-chemical choice for effectively controlling the grubs. And the best part about it, it's non-toxic to bees and other pollinating beneficial insects. In fact, grub gone has no label restrictions for use around flowering plants. So you don't have to get on your knees and remove those dandelions before application. To find more products and find Grub Gone, you can go to phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. They're the natural choice. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, author Pam Crawford will be with us. You're listening, yes, you know, to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial one 800 927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Did you know fall is the best time to plant grass? It's true. With Pearl's Premium Ultra Low Maintenance Grass Seed, it needs mowing only once every four to six weeks rather than weekly. Pearl's Premium Grass grows four foot deep roots, so it needs 75% less water and outcompetes other grasses and most weeds without chemicals and stays green year round. Buy Pearl's Premium Grass at Whole Food Markets in New England, Quality Garden Centers, or buy online at pearlspremium.com. That's pearlspremium.com. And put in the discount code, my name, Joey20, that's J-O-E-Y-2-0, for 20% off discount Today and tomorrow only. PearlsPremium.com, the best grass seed you'll ever grow. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Dr. Jim's, 
MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable and thank them for their support. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center is the place for your bulk material as well as some of your fall festival items. They've got a few pumpkins left. They've got a handful of ornamental peppers available, and when they're gone, they're gone. Also keep in mind that the bulk material yard will close at the end of October. So if you've got those projects you want to work on throughout the late fall and early winter, you need to have that those items Whatever you want to pick, 40 varieties to choose from, largest selection in the area, either picked up or delivered by the end of the month. You can find all this at Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton and Greenfield. Give them a call at 414-282-4220 or visit them online at bluemels.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Pamela Crawford is an award-winning, nationally known landscape designer and author of 10 best-selling gardening books. She has successfully designed over 1,500 landscapes in the last 25 years. Her beautiful designs are routinely covered by newspapers, national magazines, and television. Welcome to the program, Pamela. Well, thank you very much. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your day. Now, you're very passionate about container gardening. First of all, why is that? And why are container gardening so, container gardening so important? I know a lot of people who want to garden have the mindset of, well, if I can't grow it in the ground, I can't garden. There are, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, what attracted me to container gardens were the absolutely gorgeous containers coming in from Asia, particularly Vietnam. Um, as somebody who designed the landscapes, we need accents that are gorgeous, and they provide that. And then from a growing standpoint, vegetables, for example, are a lot easier to grow in containers. I remember one year that was particularly rainy here, and all my neighbors' vegetables were dying from fungus. And mine and my containers did absolutely extremely well another reason the bugs don't seem to like to walk up the side of them i didn't get anywhere near as many pests as the people around me who had them planted in the ground the other thing is instant results you can go to a garden center buy some flowers bring them home put them in a beautiful pot and you've got instant garden container gardens are not planted normally to to go forever you plant them to go for a short time, so you plant the plants right next to each other, and voila. And, and with a landscape designer like you are, you're you're looking at the color of the, the container, the color of the flower or the vegetable, and trying to accent them two together. Exactly. Okay, so sometimes people want larger containers but aren't sure how to incorporate them. They feel intimidated. What are some tips for incorporating larger containers into a landscape or even as an accent piece? Okay, first of all, larger pots are easier than smaller pots because they hold more water and they hold more soil. The plants get bigger and are happier. And I think people who just got the hang of, of using them would be very, very happy with them. Um, one of the places I love is on either side of a front door. Another area at garden entries, one on each side. Focal points and planting beds, particularly at the apex of curves. To accent a blank wall, I don't know how many times I've done that, is just put a group of three large pots in front of a wall and it completely changes it. And then on either side of a bench. Now there I would go with shorter pots, but I like the larger the better. Well, what are, what are some, uh, what are some soil tips for container gardening? Should one dump all the soil out and start over each year? Or should they fertilize it? And in addition to that, some people are intimidated by large containers because they don't want to do the initial expense of filling that large container up, and they try to use items to you fill airspace. What what do you suggest on that as well? Uh, if you're using a say you're using a pot that's four feet tall and maybe a foot and a half wide, and you're planting 
annual flowers in it. Those roots aren't going to go down to the bottom of that pot. In that situation, I put gravel on the very bottom and then a couple of inches of gravel. And then I would put mulch probably for two feet. And then I would put potting mix from there to the top. When I'm changing out plantings, I replace the potting mix as far down as the roots go from last year's planting so that the plants will have room um, in the potting soil to send their roots. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And then with that mulch, if I if my science is right, that will absorb the water and then release it up into the soil as it's needed, correct? No, I'm talking about putting the mulch on the bottom. Oh, that's yep. just using... Yeah, that's just using it as a filler because it's less expensive than potting mix. Right, right, okay. And then that makes sense to only fill, replace the soil where the roots are because why replace the whole thing if the roots aren't utilizing that soil at the very bottom? Right. But with vegetables and things like that, it's interesting. In the large pots, I can take just one tomato plant, put it in a, gosh, I'm thinking of one that's 28 inches wide, and the roots of that tomato plant will fill up that huge pot, and they just love it. They get, you get tons of tomatoes, and the tomatoes grow huge. Now, with your expertise, would you say one of the biggest uh, mistakes beginner container gardening people make is underestimating the size of the container or yes. the location of the, where it's going to be? I think it's, well, both, but it, people who are just getting started always buy these puny little tiny pots. That's great if you want to put a couple of succulents in them. But if you're planting annuals or any of the perennials or um, particularly vegetables and herbs, they really spread out. I mean, I've had sweet basil reach three feet high when I put it in a very large pot. And they're they're happier that way. And you don't need to plant five basil plants. You'll get all you need and all your neighbors need on just one. Well, when it comes to the material of a container, do you is there a specific uh, material that you gravitate towards versus another one? Uh, not really. I, I use predominantly the Asian glazed containers, with my favorite country being Vietnam in terms of what they're exporting. But China is doing some great work on that, too. And they have turned glazing pots into an art form. You can find those at your better garden centers. But I'm also using synth- synthetics. Um, I'm thinking there's a company called Lechuza, a German company, who makes self-watering c- containers that are just fabulous. They're actually made out of plastic. I would never have guessed it when I used them because they're very attractive. So it's more the appearance of the container. I haven't found a whole lot of differences in terms of materials, and I think I've tested everything that I've ever found a container made of. Well, that's um, that's interesting. So um, we are talking with Pamela Crawford. She is an author and a nationally known landscape designer. Now, what is a living wall? Maybe some people have heard of this, not really quite sure what it is. They might just be thinking of like ivy growing up the side of a building. Um, how can people plan for that now to grow next spring or whenever their ideal growing season is? Okay. Um Living wall planters are still relatively new, and they got started with the whole biophilia movement of adding green to cities, and and they were developing these really creative planters that hung on a wall, and they planted plants all along the wall. And the idea was to give people a relief from hardscape in the city and also to give them more oxygen. So... The problem came in is that the type of plants that do well there are epiphytes. And epiphytes are plants that normally grow up something, like are growing up a tree. And it's taken a lot of years of, of trial and error. And I don't, I still don't think we're there. The ones I see in public places and the ones I've been able to look at close up for a long time have a lot of plant replacements going on. And probably it's just trial and error that they're, they're figuring out. Um, what to put in it. I developed a, a small one, um, I guess it's just called Pamela Crawford Living Wall, for consumers to use for short term. Let's say you want something for a summer. These are just squares, and you can put as many squares together as you want to make them larger and larger. And those work with annuals, or they'll work with herbs. And that's just 
that's just made to have a decoration on a wall. Not not a permanent long term, but more of a seasonal. No, because the roots are constricted, and once again, it's it's the epiphytes that are going to make it long term, which are the ones that are used to sending their roots out and around whatever it is they're attached to, right. like sending it around a tree or around a wall. And I haven't done a whole lot of testing on those. Okay. Um, so you have a book coming out in January. It's called Easy Patio Veggies and Herbs. And, um, I mean, obviously it's about patio veggies and herbs, but maybe more you can tell us more about what it entails and then also maybe something specific in that book that would be interesting to our listeners. Okay. Um, this is a continuation of some other vegetable books that I've written. I wrote one on vegetables and flowers in containers. I wrote another one on herbs. And this one, I'm combining uh, veggies and herbs. And the feature on this book is to make gorgeous container garden arrangements with huge amounts of vegetables. Um, and that's been very, very exciting for me. I did a lot of trial and error with vertical pots, you know, pots that might be three feet tall and 15 inches wide, because if you're working with a small space, you can fit more of them on there. And I wanted to find out, would the tomato roots, which people had thought grew horizontally, what happened if you put them in a big, tall thing? And what happened was those roots went down to the bottom. And you take something like yellow pear tomatoes, which is one of the heirlooms, I was getting hundreds and hundreds of tomatoes off of that. So I was working on making things look good and getting huge amounts of produce. So that's been very exciting. And, I, and I've, I've worked with a lot of plants, I think, for this book. Gosh, I planted, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000, something like that, plants, because I had to try them every different way to see if it would work. And the other thing that, that's important is when – You've suddenly really pushed up the production of the vegetables. How many plants do you really need? I'll take habanero peppers as an example. I planted three habanero, four habanero pepper planters into one pot. And I ended up with close to 300 habanero peppers. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't want 300 habanero peppers. I wanted maybe three or four. So um, I um, we had Mexican restaurants all around us that we supplied with habanero peppers that summer. It's important to know before you get started, how many vegetables are you going to get if you put them in a big pot? So I studied that. And the book is designed so you can take it with you to the garden center and look up a particular vegetable and find out how many how many you're going to get before you buy four of them when maybe you only need one. And, of course, the other emphasis is to make make the vegetables look really good. Instead of using tomato cages, which I hate, I used either beautiful trellises to support the vegetables or something called obelisks. You can Google that, and they have a lot of different ones for sale, which are which are tall, decorative metal supports, and I would put them in the pot. Sometimes I'd spray them, and it was just fun. I mean, it's nice to know that. If your patio, like most people's, all your whole house overlooks it, you don't want it to be ugly. And it's really nice to know that you can grow large quantities of food right there conveniently and have them attractive. Absolutely. And that's the other thing. No matter what you're growing, you kind of want to know what the potential expectation is on that crop or the size of the flower that you're growing so you can know what kind of container or where to Mm -hmm. properly place it so you're not brushing into it every time you walk in the house. Right. And I have container sizes, of course, for for every vegetable. It's got, I mean, yes, it's got a lot of beautiful pictures in it because I'm proud of all the beautiful results that I had. But at the same time, it's a very practical book. If you go to the tomato page, I've got, I think I tried, I don't know, maybe 20 different varieties of tomatoes. Well, for each one, I'm going to tell you things like how big of a pot you need, which is also critical. Most people have a tendency to buy pots that are too small, and you need to know before you mess something up. Absolutely. Well, Pamela, we greatly appreciate the information and the time you've given us. How can people find more about you and find your books? 
Um, they can find my website. It's Pamela Crawford and Associates, and that's up and running right now. I still have a lot of work to do on it to change it over from Florida because I'm not in Florida anymore. Um, and then they can also go to YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, and I have an awful lot of videos on container gardens. Well, we thank you for the time you've given us, Pamela, not only educating Holly and myself, but all of our listeners across the country, and we thank you for that. Okay, thank you. And do not go anywhere. When we come back, it's going to be about your garden questions, our garden answers. You are tuned in to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Wisconsin Greenhouse Company designs greenhouses specifically built for the northern Midwest climate. All of their greenhouses are made to withstand heavy snow and wind for years to come. They build freestanding and home-attached greenhouses for both commercial growers, schools, and backyard gardeners. Visit WisconsinGreenhouseCompany.com. For more information on pricing or to request a greenhouse catalog, go to WisconsinGreenhouseCompany.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. At Big Elk Garlic Farm, they are passionate about their garlic and take great care to provide you with the best seed stock around. Their high-quality garlic is non-GMO. They stand behind their product 100%. Get your garlic for this fall's planting at BigElkGarlicFarm.com. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. You know what time it is. It's time for question and answers. If you've got a question, you can submit it to us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW, toll-free, coast-to-coast, 1-800-927. Get in line, uh, create a nice, orderly fashion line, uh, talk among yourselves, and we'll get to your question as it comes up. First question, Holly, is about planting some tulips. Uh, it is October now and... Turnips. Turn, oh, turnips. I, it is October now and I just cleared a bunch of weeds and shrubs and trees. Uh, can I plant turnips as a cover crop now or is it too late here in Zone 5B? Zone 5B is uh, many different places across the country. Uh, so can they do such? Can they use, now cover crops are used for a variety of different ways, correct, Holly? Yeah, a lot of times cover crops, especially a root crop, helps kind of loosen the soil. Opens up, creates opens cavities, up, yeah, right? Yeah, cre- creates cavities. Um, we actually tried this with those daikon radishes. Right. Um, but you, many, many years ago before we were more educated on the procedure. Right. So, um, I, th- I think it's too, too late well no you can well here's the thing you can plant these as late as november uh 
as late as November, and it will still be a good cover crop, assuming that the ground is not frozen. You've got to have two or three weeks, you know, give or take a little bit, of some good soil you know, moisture as well as not being frozen. And these things will uh, grow without any issues. So keep that in mind. You want to obviously plant these just like garlic. We can still plant garlic from Big Elk Garlic Farm up to this time that the, the ground is frozen. However, it's best if we can get in the ground about 30 days before the ground freezes. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago on how to do such uh, plant successful garlic in many parts of the country. Uh, let's see here. Another question, Holly. Uh, if I may ask a question about a previous topic, I think it was you that suggested not throwing away old seeds. I will not be using them, but putting them out for birds. Are there any seeds that birds and chipmunks and or squirrels should not have? Well, number one, uh, you're doing a very nice thing by feeding the chipmunks and the squirrels because many people do not want them around. Right. Yeah. Uh, they're afraid they're going to we, We've talked about this in the program as well as we've done a couple of videos on this on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. Don't let the name fool you. As well as on our YouTube channel, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, where we go through uh, over the winter, we go through the old seeds, like we talked about in segment one, that are very old, that we know there's no chance that they're going to germinate, or we've done a germination test on them, and they're poor in the percentile of germination. So we put them in a big jar, and we save them and put them in bird feeders in the spring. Now, we, we have pumpkin seeds all the way to lettuce seeds to turnip seeds. We have a variety of seeds. All of these seeds can be introduced into your bird feeder or squirrel feeder or whatever, as long as they're not treated. Many of the garden seeds that you'll purchase um, around the country will not have a coating on them. Some seeds are coated with a clay substance around them and then also painted for visibility purposes whenever you plant them in the ground. Others are treated with a yellowish powder, which is an insecticide, I believe it is, of some sort. I know the big farmers have, it, it's a chemical that they use uh, on the seed to keep it from being eaten. However, uh, turkeys and birds will go in and eat those seeds because the volume of seeds in which those animals have to ingest before they become sick or die is very, very large. So um, it, it as long as the seeds are just normal natural seeds, you're totally fine. Not going to hurt at all to uh, utilize them in the garden. Uh, what's our next question here? So they want to know, is it good to take the old not disease plant stalks and leaves and compost that in the soil? They have clay soil and it helps. They feel that it would help break it up and in the spring the worms would eat it or come find it. Is that good? Um, they don't use the root of plants. Love your show, Linda. Well, you can certainly do that. You can take the non-diseased plants and uh, and leaves and compost and, and work them in the soil uh, to break up that clay. Now, clay soil, people think clay soil is horrible and non-valuable. Uh, However, clay soil contains a tremendous amount of nutrients, but it's so bound up that it doesn't release it. And, it, you know, if you can amend the soil, whether through compost, through shredded leaves, through regular leaves through plant debris such as this and break those particles up, then it releases and it allows it to be usable in a usable form for the springtime. But yeah, you can certainly use the non-diseased plants and stalks and leaves and the compost and compost them in the soil. Uh, there's a variety of different ways, obviously, and maybe it's not obvious. Uh, we'll, we'll tell how it is. When you compost anything, whether it's paper, whether it's leaves, whether it's plant debris, the smaller the particle, the faster it will break down and the more surface area that is created. That way in the spring, you're not, uh, or next summer or whatever, you're not dealing with large chunks of particles in the soil, but it, it, the microbial life, the worms and, and all the creepy crawly things that we don't see because they're so microscopic, um, will have already utilized and broke these things down. Yeah, if you throw a bunch of leaves on the ground like we do, uh, they will break down. However, it takes a very long time, takes six, eight months in order for them to biodegrade versus if they were in a very small particle size uh, in that. So, yeah, you can do that. Now, other people will, while we're talking about amending soil, Holly, uh, there's kind of two rules of thought. 
One is throw it on top or, or fork it in. And the other is, um, take and cover the garden with it and then till it in. Is, and it's, there's some science, there's science behind the, the, the detrimental, uh, that tilling can do to the soil life, the soil web. Uh, but some people choose to go that route. Right. And what it'll do, like you said, it'll, it'll tear up the soil web. Um, it can also increase weeds. Right. You're bringing weeds you're gonna, up. Yeah. yeah. You're going to, um, increase weed seeds. So there are some disadvantages. But to, some people to find, some people till every week and they have every year. It, well, they, some people till every week for weed control between the rows. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, in the, in, and there's not, I mean, we don't choose to do that. However, many people do and they find great success. Is it, is it scientifically proven that, that they're, they're horrible gardeners? No. No. But, but I think it's also just what you're used to, what you've been doing, what you've done. And maybe you just don't want to, to try to grow a different way or, uh, maintain your soil a different way. Right. Um, and maybe there, you know, we'll talk about it, um, in future episodes next year about how we can do, get more out of the garden with less work. And so that's kind of what we look at. Uh, time for one more question here. I've got some rhubarb that is dying back. When is the correct time to divide it, replant it? How often? How do I do it? Sure. So what you want to do is you want to do this in the early spring as soon as you can, you can reach into that soil. So once it's thawed, basically. Okay. What you're going to do is you're going to reach down to the crown and you're going to be able to feel those, the different crowns. Mm-hmm. And then you just separate it that way. Because if you don't separate, it basically chokes it, uh, choke itself out. Right. It, it, it does kind of choke and itself And we, out. we've seen this. We grow it in containers because something about, and, and still haven't figured this out after 12 years of gardening at, at uh, Holly's mom, something terrible happened years ago with rhubarb in the ground. We don't know. I've not been told... <laughs> No rhubarb. No rhubarb no, in the ground. No. So we converted, okay. we, we started it from seed and grew it in large containers and we've got multiple videos on that. But I don't know what has happened or what happened or who got hurt by, you know, attacking rhubarb. I don't know. Uh, but we grow it in the containers and we will have to divide it because it's been about th- four years now. And, uh, that's about the time frame in which you want to start dividing your rhubarb. Uh, and rhubarb is a phenomenal plant. If you like it, it's very prolific. Right. So you want to divide it. You're going to be able to feel those root bulbs, and that's how you want to divide it. You want to be able to kind of feel each separate root bulb, and then you want to take them apart. So with that being said, hey, we're out of time. We're sorry about that, but that's how life goes. Uh, miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can do that by going to our website, the thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and clicking on the Radio Season 4 tab at the top of the page. Or you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and uh, ask for the replay of this program, and we can send it to you in audio and in studio video form. Tell your friends and tell your family and your people that you don't like that this garden show is on the radio as on, as well as podcast replay. So join us next week on the on the show. We'll be talking about different types of gardening methods. Obviously, we're in the latter portions of the growing season in many portion, many parts of the country, but many people are not aware that there are so many different ways in which we can produce our own, own food, whether from inside in the basement all the way to everything outside. So we'll cover some of those uh, popular ones and very unfamiliar ones next week, as well as growing your own herbs, spices, and teas. That'll be an interesting conversation, as well as the canning diva, Diana, uh, Diana De- Deverox will be with us, and your garden questions. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>